Well, good morning, and it's my privilege to introduce our first speaker, um, Judge Nelson Wolf. As you can see from your materials on your on your table, Judge Wolf has served the people of San Antonio and Bear County for more than 40 years in various capacities. First in the Texas State House, the Texas Senate, the San Antonio City Council, as mayor of San Antonio, and he's now in his fourth term as county judge. Some of the major accomplishments during his uh, public service uh, have included successful economic development uh, efforts to bring this to San Antonio, Medtronic, Coles, Becton, Dickinson, and the expansion of their Toyota motor manufacturing plant to include the uh, Tundra. He has also overseen a $900 million plan to build a new trauma center at, uh, and other improvements to the university health system. Uh, he has overseen the establishment of the University of Texas at San Antonio's downtown campus, uh, and also the largest parks bond issue in history, in the city's history. Uh, but in addition to a long and, and uh, fruitful political career, he's had kind of parallel careers uh, in business and as an author. Uh, Mr. Wolf, his father, and his brothers uh, created, grew, and later sold Alamo Enterprises Building Supplies, and then he and his brothers went on to found Sun Harvest Farms, a successful chain of natural food stores, and then sold that in 1999. As an author, Mr. Wolf has written books about his experience in the Texas legislature, about his experience leading the city of San Antonio as mayor, and about his passion, baseball, uh, in a book called Baseball for Real Men, and his fourth book was about a topic that, that led us to invite him here today. Uh, when Linda began putting together the, the agenda for this week, she naturally asked a number of uh, local leaders on, about who would be the right person or persons to address the, the transformation that San Antonio has undergone. Uh, and she, I, she expected to get a, a, a short list of high quality candidates, but I think she was surprised to get over and over again the same name from each of these folks that she asked. Uh, and it was Nelson Wolf. And it turns out that his fourth book was entitled Transforming San Antonio. And we are pleased to have him here with us today. And I would appreciate you helping me welcome Judge Wolf. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank all of you for coming to San Antonio. Uh, we were just talking a little earlier before uh, the start of your meeting today. Uh, my uh, brother uh, had been in the, has been in the horse race business for uh, 40 years. And, and when you're in the horse race business, maybe 5% make money. Y'all should know you're in that part of the country. Um, one year, he had a good year. And uh, we went to Keeneland, which I think is right up by y'all. Went through all the horse country of Kentucky. I went to Kentucky Derby that year. His horse had won the day before in the La Trion, I believe it is. And so we, we had a great time uh, seeing your beautiful uh, country up in Kentucky and the times of, of, of excitement, for at least for my brother, and we, we just followed him around. Uh, I, I understand you all are looking at maybe doing a couple of different things in Lexington, uh, some of your work in the downtown area, uh, maybe setting in place some sort of a planning organization or a process. Let me just quickly hit on two. Uh, during the time that uh, <clears throat> I was on the city council, uh, or before I became on the city council, Mayor Henry Cisneros, and I'll, I'm going to leave this with you, uh, really was the mayor that uh, began to transform San Antonio and, and, and put power in the mayor of office and power in local government to form partnerships. And that was the basis of his uh, a term starting in 1981, economic development. He also started a process called Target 90, uh, which include over a thousand citizens in San Antonio that looked ahead in a five-year time frame, uh, set the uh, uh, goals, specific goals, and then things that you needed to do to carry out the goals that amounted to several hundred of them. I chaired that effort for two years uh, as we looked ahead and, and, and began not only to set the plan, but to execute the plan. Uh, just here recently, and, and I think we had a very good process. After five years, uh, we took the organization away, it went away, goodbye, it finished its process, and maybe accomplished about 80, 90 percent of most of the goals that were set. Uh, here recently, Mayor Castro uh, has come into office uh, almost four years ago now and set in process a 2020, and you will hear about that from Daryl Byrd, who's heading up that organization, 
uh, a similar type plan where they would look ahead in the future and, and set some goals and objectives uh, for, for the future. So I believe those things are good and helpful to a community. There was like a 20, what, 25 year span between uh, uh, Cisneros' kind of broad lookout for five years and then uh, Castro's now startup. Those are helpful, but uh, that's only the little tiny beginning. <laughs> uh, planning is great, input is essential, uh, setting those goals and objectives, but really and truly in, to make things happen, uh, you have to have what you might want to call power politics. People got to make it happen. You either got to have a mayor that's totally committed. Uh, in my case, I'm now the uh, county judge, which is a misnomer uh, when you say county judge, because it's my, my responsibility to uh, run county government along with four commissioners that uh, make up the commissioner's court. Uh, I remember when I, I was first appointed and has since won three elections when I was first appointed, I used to stop by McDonald's, which is not a good thing to do. And the lady there, after I was appointed, said, I'm so happy that now you're a county judge. I've been wanting <clears throat> to divorce my husband for years, and now I have someone to go to. <laughs> it was a terrible disappointment <laughs> that I told her I couldn't do that. <laughs> but uh, what we've tried to do in, in the time that I've come over to county government, I think this is really important. I don't know what your governmental units are, but there's an array of them. There's an array of them here. Unless you get the governmental entities on the same page, along uh, with support from the private sector and leadership from the private sector, you really won't do anything very meaningful. And unless you have some uh, public officials that are willing to move out of their little uh, cove, uh, whether it's county judge or mayor or whatever they are, and reach beyond that and, and pull partnerships together to make things happen, you won't get anywhere. I don't know your mayor, I don't know your county judge or whatever you're calling. Uh, but you got I think your, your, your community leaders at, at, from a public's perspective are important. Those special commissions that you may have, and we have them here, uh, are all important. But you got to pull, that's a group you got to pull together. Uh, we, I probably work with about a good 10 of them here. And I know everyone on their boards. I've, uh, I know everything about what they're doing. <laughs> and, and it's critical to pull them together. Uh, almost every project that we have done uh, since I've become county judge has uh, relied on partners, every one of them. I can't think of any that we've, that we've done where we didn't have a partner, whether it be the city or VIA or, or a number of other entities and along with private sector uh, support. Uh, I think you've got to think about how is a better way to use your taxes that these governmental entities have got. Uh, as you know, I'm sure you went through the same thing. There was this 2008 November financial implosion, the worst we've had since the uh, Depression. And county governments and local governments had to tighten up somewhat. And uh, we developed a, a pretty strong philosophy uh, during that period of time as we looked ahead knowing that the road would be a little bit rocky. Uh, we decided to cut back on our operating budget and to focus on uh, narrowing that down. So we worked with less employees than we did uh, uh, in 2008, pre-2008, still do today. What we did with the money was take it and use it for capital projects, projects that we thought could generate some long-term growth. And we're in the process now of investing somewhere close to $2 billion in various different projects, along with the partner and, and, and almost every one of them. Uh, you may have a hotel motel tax. Uh, that you use in a car rental tax, which has always gone to convention centers, has gone to uh, uh, professional sports franchises, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but we decided to do something different. Uh, we went to the legislature and got them to expand the role of the hotel motel tax. So we took uh, four different uh, areas and decided and put up task forces and had them work together and looked for partners on them and all of them. And we went to the voters on four different propositions. Uh, one of them was to build a performing arts center. Now, I would have thought that would have been our most difficult vote. Uh, we put up $100 million, created a, 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 a nonprofit entity. Uh, the city gave us the building and the land to use, which is the old municipal auditorium. You may want to go by there. Uh, we've finished the demolition piece of it now, and now we're starting to go up with it. 
And then the private sector is raising 52 million to match our 100 million and to match the land and the buildings that the city, that the city gave. So it's being, the entity is being run uh, by, by the private sector in a nonprofit corporation and we provided the funding for it and they draw as they move along on their, on their process. We did the same with the Briscoe Western Art Museum. You may want to go by there, it's right on the river. Uh, we put uh, a total of about six million into that project they, and the private sector raised over another 20 million. The building's completed. Uh, it's a pavilion plus a restoration of a historic building. Not open yet, uh, uh, probably will be open in about a year as the, as, as the uh, process goes through to accumulate the different uh, art that, that will be in that building. Uh, we have an older building uh, called the Alameda Theater. We put, we're putting six million into it and restoring, and restoring that building. A partner in every one of those major art projects that we went to the voters with. Then we went to the voters uh, with 13 regional sports parks, almost every one of them in the central inner city. Every one of them we have a partner, $85 million, double that, because the partners put up the land and in many cases put up additional capital. We, had part, we have partners uh, that range from the Archdiocese of San Antonio on 130 acres on the south end of the uh, 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 part of the river uh, to UTSA and, and to other uh, entities, 501c3s across the community, little leagues, et cetera. And so we're in the process of building those 13 regional sports parks now, uh, which uh, five are completed and all the rest are under construction. So that, th that's moving along. Then we identified what I think is the most important public works project of our time. And you see a bit of it while you're down here, and that's the San Antonio River. There had been a long process of uh, of attempting to identify uh, how you would uh, fund expanded uh, uh, river walk and how you would do it different going south downtown. Again, in that process, we had a lot of partners. We had the Corps of Army Engineers on the project going south. We had the city of San Antonio. Uh, we had the San Antonio River Authority. We had the National Park Service, uh, an array of different uh, uh, partners that were involved on that. Uh, the north part of the river, if you walk down it and you'll get up to the Pearl, which is a wonderful development in itself for you to see. Uh, Kit Goldsberry made that happen. Uh, if, you find, if you find somebody that's got a billion dollars and don't know what to do with it, uh, please talk them into investing <laughs> in your community in a, in, a, in a project that will transform things, and his certainly is transforming that area. Uh, and, but when you go south on the river, we asked the voters for $125 million uh, to go south. South has been the part of the city that's got all the baddies and the good parts have gone north. It's got, uh, you know, the treatment plants and the water runoff and never, never, never have we invested in the south like we should and we started doing that during the time I was mayor. But so we put our 125 million plus we added another 50 million to all the money just going south. We were relying on the federal government, don't ever do that, uh, to complete that project. We had one hero, Kay Bailey Hutchinson, who worked very hard to earmark money. Oh my God, what a terrible, terrible thing that is to do. A vetted project she earmarked money for. The most important project we have. And guess what, it was stuffed down her throat when she ran for governor and she lost because she was, ear part of it was because she was earmarking money. I don't know what happened to our congressmen and our senators that feel that they need to go up there and be uh, so uh, good that they don't, do anything to bring funds back down to help help governmental entities. Well, she did, and she, she kept it alive. She kept it alive, barely alive. And then we went to the voters and asked them for the additional fund. It, it will complete everything that we're going on, on the south of the river, and I encourage you to go there. Totally different. It's the largest environmental restoration of an urban river anywhere in the United States. If you go down there and, and go down to Mission Road, at uh, Lone Star Boulevard, uh, uh, there's a small park there called Roosevelt Park. That's the start of the Mission Reach. And everything going south is the environmental restoration. We're planting 25,000 trees, numerous plants and grasses that we've planted along the way, uh, jogging trail where you can ride a bike or walk or jog, uh, picnic areas, um, and then the four missions. Every one of you will know something about the Alamo. But the jewels really are south. There hadn't been anything that kind of linked them together, though. The river was the back road. It, they really turned the river into a drainage ditch. 
uh, Corps did that in the 50s and 60s. So now the missions will have a, a front door and we've provided money for a portal to each one of them where there's a view corridor down to the river. Uh, so we have now completed two miles. You can go two miles down it. Uh, we'll open up two more miles by early fall. And then the last four miles will be open by the end of 2013. So that mission reaches an eight, eight mile stretch of river uh, that's restored. Uh, little dams and weirs would aerate the water. Birds have come back, fish are coming. You'll be able to canoe in part of it. Uh, so it, it, it's a different project and one that, uh, as I stated, required a, a number of partners to go. And the county's role was to ensure that it got done by providing the funding where the gaps were, and there were big gaps, uh, that, that, that weren't able, able to get any money uh, from, 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 the federal, from the federal government to do. So uh, all those projects require partners. Uh, I just uh, met uh, Jeff, who's working on your uh, downtown development authority. Uh, Mayor Castro, in his uh, uh, original addresses to the city, wanted to focus on the downtown area, uh, which I think is a very, very, uh, a, a very, very good, good thing to be doing. Uh, uh, one that requires a, a huge amount of investment uh, to turn it around and to make it work. So there are a number of things that we have done, again, collectively, uh, to make that happen. Uh, one, downtowns just don't work right unless you have enough people living there. And we do not have and have not had enough people living in the downtown area. And when I say downtown, the central city area, uh, we've had maybe 3,000 or so, I'm not quite sure what. Uh, but so we put in process a number of incentives for housing under a policy, housing first. That in itself can be controversial. Housing first. Uh, so <clears throat> today, if you do go down to the Pearl Brewery, uh, you will see something like almost 900 to 1,000 apartment units going up in that area, all very, very nice ones. Uh, you'll see a, a large one that was completed here not too long ago by Ed. Vistana. Uh, even going south now, we're beginning to see that. Uh, one opened um, uh, just uh, right down by Blue Star, again, which the river connects down to, to the, to, to the uh, Mission Reach. They just opened 250 apartments. There are another 90 are being built. So we're doing everything we can to give the financial incentives plus the infrastructure to encourage people to live downtown. I don't know about your state, but this state here uh, is a very conservative state and it's, it's been strong for economic development and the, and the governor's done a wonderful job on it. Uh, but they've, uh, they've uh, pretty well dried up the funds for transit, uh, for, for highways, uh, where we've had to come up with more and more money to make them happen here in the urban area. So the days of flying out highways everywhere in suburbia and, and everything uh, growing out, 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 uh, it's slowly coming to a halt, I think, in Texas. And so those cities that create an urban living, I think are gonna be the ones that survive and ones that thrive. Now, part of that urban living is having a public transit system. Uh, we're the only major city left in the United States that not does not have a rail component of it. So we pulled three entities together to make that happen. Via our transit authority, of which we appoint some members and the city appoints some members, and uh, we pulled them together, we pulled the city of San Antonio and the county together. And VIA came up with a plan uh, to create, over a period of time, a phased in multimodal uh, transit plan. I don't think an urban area can survive without a good transit plan. Uh, <laughs> they came up with the idea of doing two uh, multimodal terminals east and west of downtown. We've talked about it for 20 years, it's nothing new, but we never did anything about it east and west of downtown, two outlying park and ride uh, 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 transfer stations, I guess you would say, uh, north and south, a streetcar system in the inner city, in the downtown area, starting in the downtown area, about uh, four or five miles, I think, to start with, uh, going each way, um, and then with the expanded authority behind that. Now, again, we were always running up to Washington, you know, you got any money for public transit, and you know, wasting our time uh, until you do something. Uh, I don't think you're gonna get a lot of support out of the folks up there. 
So we came up with a local plan between the three governmental entities to come up with $239 million to implement that first phase of the plan. Uh, the county took the first vote, I've always believed, and, and uh, that you should be first because you make just as many mistakes being second and last as you do first. So we jumped on it, created a little pressure. Uh, city came through, voted on that, B had voted on theirs, and so now we have in place a $239 million plan to move that forward. Uh, we did end up, after we did the plan, getting a little money from the federal government on the, on the transit, on the multimodal terminal to the uh, south of us, um, to, the, to the west of downtown, excuse me. Uh, so that, that, that's going to move along and, and that's going to come about and that's going to uh, be extremely important to uh, revitalize the inner city. So as you look at that, I think in your city, you need to determine what do you think is important uh, to make that work? And is there a way that governmental entities can partner with the private sector? Are they getting the capital, they taking the risk, and the government entities giving some tax phase ins or outright grants uh, for, for living units to be built, as well as, uh, as well as businesses that coming in into the inner city. We just had a vacant, <coughs> a vacant building when AT&T decided that uh, they wanted to move to Dallas. Uh, uh, it was really a blow to the community when they did that. So they left a big open building downtown. We just recently filled it up by offering some incentives to the, uh, to the two major tenants that are filling that, uh, that, that, that building up. So I think the message that I would want to leave with you is, yep, do the planning thing. It helps you get the buy-in. Uh, but you've got to identify some people that are uh, will uh, take the risk, and every risk a public official takes today um, is, uh, uh, you know, somewhat hazardous. <laughs> but you're going to have to get them to do that if you want to get anything, anything done in your community. We're also investing. We have a hospital district uh, that is uh, made up of, uh, of uh, seven members, hospital board, I point three, and we approve their budgets and tax rates, and we're now building a about a $900 million worth of new facilities, in, of which uh, a major building, as you see it coming in from the north, is going up downtown. So I believe that's what I want to leave with you. <laughs> you'll, get, you'll get to hear from uh, 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 Mr. Bird here in a little while, and he'll be able to tell you more about the 2020 process and the things that you go through uh, with respect to that. But I think the message is, it's all about partners. It's all about building personal relationships. Philosophical, you know, that's okay, that's good, but personal relationships, personal ties, willing to push a little harder on some of those personal ties uh, will get you going whatever it is you might decide you want to do. So with that, I don't know where you got time for questions. Uh, I'd be glad to try to Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, she is. <laughs> right. Well, I think it's important, and I do it myself. I'm 71 years old, but I think I've got the mind of a 30-year-old. I mean, not the body, but the mind. <laughs> I think it's important and, and uh, for, for those of us that have had a little experience and been around a while to help develop new leadership. I'm, I'm excited whenever someone comes to me that is bright and well-educated and wants to run, and I generally jump in their race and help them. Uh, we had a young man, <laughs> it really is getting young, you think the mayor is young. Uh, we had a young man, Ray Saldana, who came to me and he was running against a person where all the establishment was supporting. And he was 24 years old and he's a graduate of Stanford and was captain of the baseball team. Of course, baseball's closed, but very, very bright young man and so committed. So I helped him. I jumped in there, raised money for him, did everything in the world for him, sent out mailers for him together, and he won. So i uh, done the same thing with uh, a number of other, other young candidates. Some will lose, some will win. 
But I think it's important for the leadership of a community that have that experience that identifies that young leadership because they bring so much more energy to, the, to, to, to what they want to do. Uh, is to identify that and support them, you know, get out and give them money and go door to door with them and get them elected. On coal, yeah. Energy, energy. Well, I served on the C, C, first of all CPS, which is an, another major aspect of it, is is owned by the city of San Antonio, and there's five members on that board. I served on that board for nine years, four as mayor, and then five in the public sector. And over the years, CPS, we we always diversified our our energy sources between nuclear power natural gas and coal, usually about a third each. And as you know, as we move forward, more people want to see sustainable energy. Uh, it costs you more, and you must be willing to accept that. Uh, during the time I was on the board, we began buying wind power from West Texas. Wind power is the largest sustainable um, energy source in Texas today. Uh, then you also have the solar power, and CPS is moving forward they created a small solar farm, which is about, I think, gives them about three megawatts, not very much. Uh, and then they're talking about doing a bigger one. There's a lot of hazards in solar power, <laughs> a lot of hazards. Uh, I hope they know what they're doing. Uh, we all want to be supportive of, the, of, the, uh, of, uh, of uh, renewable energy, but we have to understand its cost. Uh, we did that with our building. We got a million dollar grant for our solar from the federal government, we got 750 from, uh, from uh, uh, CPS. We put up a million something, and if we calculated right, <clears throat> we'll get paid back on that in about 85 years, our million. Of course, the panels will go bad by then. <laughs> so, so when you do that renewable, you know, you know, there's hazards and there's additional costs, but again, you're trying to offset some of the environmental, environmental concerns. What we have now in Texas is this huge field that's to the, right to the south of us, uh, Eagle Ford, which is a, uh, a shell formation that's producing a huge amount of gas and hu huge amount of oil. So natural gas now, if you're going to do anything, I'd lock in your price on natural gas today if you could. <laughs> it's really at a low level. Yes, sir. Yes, could you expand on the housing first, uh, whether there are any city incentives involved in that? and? How did you all come to the conclusion that that was important, and what was your uh, plan to get developers to come to town for that? Well, uh, first of all, uh, that became part of the 2020, I, I believe, and then uh, uh, the council had a, a consultant that did a number of, uh, uh, of looks at it. Not all the council people agreed with it, uh, but the, the report to the council, and I believe they voted on it, uh, was housing first, and I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, uh, like I say, there was a debate on it, but, but I think it's exactly right, because you've got to get people living down here for all the other things to work. And so we do tax phase-ins, 10-year period, depending on the project, could be 50%, 75%, or 100%, depending on how much is being invested. There are some E85 grants that we've used where it's an outright grant uh, to the person. Uh, so the, the combination of those things, we figure it costs about $15,000 more per a unit to build in the, in, in the central city as it does to build out in suburbia. So you've got to make that, 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 that work for the developer. If he can't recoup that 15, he's going to build somewhere else. Reports have shown that up to 15% of new starts, uh, people would like to live in the inner city. Not everybody's, far, not everybody's going to do that. But we figure around 15, unless that's changed. Uh, so if you got, say, 7,000 possible starts on new homes or apartments, you know, 15 or percent of whatever you got should go, they probably would like to live downtown. The other piece of that strategy is that we have a, a company called Rackspace here, which is made up of bright young people. Uh, a, a good, good person uh, 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 is the uh, principal owner and, and is now a, a billionaire, and he is committed to creating a lifestyle for young people. 
We all work to bring jobs here, but the, you're probably better off, we, we would probably all be better off if we gave uh, incentives for bright young people <laughs> to come to your community. So we're trying to create that urban lifestyle, and, and he's looking at making some major investments, and so uh, we're working with him on, on trying to identify exactly what he, what, what, what he wants to do what he wants to do. So the youth, youth today, I think when I got out of college, we were um, married at uh, average at the age of about 22, and bang, we had those kids right away. You know, we populated the country. Uh, today, <laughs> you, it's about 32 average age. So you got this 22, 32, bright young people, you know, doing very well in whatever jobs they're in, but they got a little different lifestyle, and they, they like music, they like all the different kind of things that an urban living would bring to them, and so that, that's part of the reason why we're, why we're trying to create this. Yes, sir. Well, you know, it, you, you can't beat Austin for, for, for where young people want to live. You know, 6th Street, if you ever go down it, and, you know, they probably got 30 or 40 different little bars uh, down 6th Street. They, they use their river, which is what we're, we're doing now, uh, creating uh, uh, different recreational opportunities. Uh, but, you know, I don't think we'll ever be as strong as Austin is in that area. Uh, they've got the University of Texas uh, and, in Austin. We, may, we have UTSA. We have five colleges here. But they've created a, a, a wonderful, and then they've got Dell Computer there, uh, which has been their big, um, one of their big genera ge generators in high tech. Uh, we're not at that level. I wish we were. Uh, we hope Rackspace will be <laughs> our Dell. Uh, uh, as, they, as they move forward. He went into an older part of the city east, and they've got about 2,500 people working out there. Uh, but they're far ahead of us in those areas. Um, so we're just now, I think, getting our act together to create that sort of urban living environment uh, that a lot of young people would like and, uh, and would want to come here. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're ahead of us, but we, we've got a lot of strengths that they don't have but they've got the better educated workforce, they've got UT, they've got the capital, uh, they've got a lot of wonderful resources, and, and that'll probably be one of the premier cities in the United States as it begins to continue to expand, not the Austin itself, but the SMA that surrounds it. Uh, uh, we'll have our niche, but uh, uh, who knows, if we keep going where we're going, maybe one day we'll surpass them. <laughs> but they're ahead of us now. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you for inviting me to come. One thing I would encourage you to do, you're right here downtown. If you would go over to Nuevo Street, which is right behind the courthouse, uh, right where Main Street kind of crosses, you'll see um, a dam there and, and, uh, and uh, like a bridge there. And if you want to go rent a bike from one of the bike rental programs here, or if you want to walk, or you want to um, jog or whatever, go right down on the river there. You can ride your bike straight down. And from that, from that point, uh, we have a mile of what we call the Eagle Land, uh, right through the King William housing area. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful walk. You can ride your bike or walk uh, three miles now. I must warn you, though, there's one section of the river by Brackenridge High School that they're, that they're restoring a uh, wall on. You may have to divert around that. But anyway, you'll be able to go about three miles today, but so you might want to do that. Well, have a good time here. See the city. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Nelson, for sharing your perspective to us. We appreciate that, and uh, here's our gift to you. Thank You're you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I need to cue with Linda. Are we breaking or doing the next session? Breaking? <laughs>